To understand the water thread experiment, let's take a look at this simple diagram. At the top, we have a water tank that has two nozzles, allowing two streams of water to drop down into two bowls or buckets. That's the basic. Then inserted in that, first we have two copper discs, each one with a hole in the center to allow the stream to go through, and two copper plates, one in each bowl, receiving the stream at the bottom. The copper plate on one side is connected by a copper wire to the copper disc on the other side, and vice versa, with no connection between the wires. When the streams start to flow, the first thing that's noticed is that the water begins to curve up and tries to reach back to the copper disc. That is, it takes on a levity function and goes counter to gravity. When this experiment is performed in the dark, if a neon bulb is put into the stream, contrary to known laws of electrostatics, it will light up. If a vacuum tube is connected either to the copper plate or the copper disc of either side, it will glow brightly, the brightness depending on the quality or liveliness of the water. If one touches the copper disc, they will certainly get a small shock. This experiment shows the levitational powers of the vortex in the egg shape. This is an egg on a string here, in a stream of water. And we see the egg's been sucked into the stream and actually rotates opposite to the stream, rotating upstream. You don't see that it's sucked in. Unwind. Let us see again go in reverse to the flow. This same principle was used by Victor for experimental flying discs, which were successfully flown during his research in World War II. In the implosion motor, a diamagnetic field was developed which made the lifting power possible. On the 19th of February, 1945, near Prague, the first test of an unmanned flying disc took place. In three minutes, it climbed to a height of 15,000 meters and attained a horizontal speed of 2,200 kilometers per hour. It could hover motionless in the air and could fly as fast backwards as forwards. This flying disc had a diameter of 50 meters. Another model based on Victor's prototype was built by a German engineer, Hermann Klaas, in 1941, who reported, In all truth, this invention flew with almost unbelievable success. It climbed straight up into the air so suddenly that, unfortunately, it hit the workshop ceiling and crashed to the ground in pieces. In 1934, Hitler had specially requested to meet Victor and was well informed of his earlier work. Later, during the war, he was given the choice either to develop machines for the Third Reich or he would be hanged. Understandably, he chose the work and during this time, the Flying Saucer Project was initiated. During this period, consideration was also given to biological submarine design. Victor was against using biotechnology for destructive purposes and probably never released his full designs to the Nazis. However, this may have given rise to the rumors later on that Hitler had escaped to South America in a flying saucer or submarine, that his death in the Berlin bunker was a fabrication. Whatever the truth, both the Russians and the Americans were highly interested in Victor's work. After the war, the Russians ransacked his apartment and then blew it up to prevent the Allies from gleaning any overlooked secrets. He was confined by the Americans in what was called protective custody for almost a year 
and was forbidden to take up any further research into the atomic energy fields. He had warned about the danger of nuclear power and called the splitting of the atom an offense against nature. With few resources left to him, Victor concentrated on agricultural problems. His work was devoted to increasing the Earth's vitality and to encourage the buildup and preservation of the insulating skin of the Earth. He condemned all kinds of artificial fertilizer which exhaust the soil and upsets the delicate balance of nature. Victor had never turned his back on the ancient farming traditions. Rather, he enjoyed the company of old farmers and a simple country life. He had said, the old farmer was, for the clod of the earth, both its priest and doctor. In Schelberger's writings, he relates one ancient practice that had survived up to his time, and that was called the practice of clay singing. Uh, when Schelberger first heard about this, he went over to visit an old farmer, and he heard the farmer singing, and he thought the farmer had gone mad. He went and checked it out, and he saw him stirring just clear water in a barrel. Get stirred, get a vortex going in one direction, then reverse it the other way and he would throw like little handfuls of loamy soil in every now and then. And on the counterclockwise stir, he would sing upscale from very deep bass up to high falsetto and then reverse that on the clockwise going downscale. And then this water was taken and sprayed with like a broom like this and it would be sprayed around on the land and allowed to dry. And this would leave like a very fine crystalline structure which would help charge up the land organically. This spade was based on Victor Schauberger's agricultural theories. It's a solid oak spade coated with copper. Now Victor noticed that with the decline of the ancient agricultural methods like the use of the wooden plow that there came a concomitant decrease in the fertility of the soil. The soil would dry out and not sustain life. Now Victor discovered that this was due to the iron plows that were coming into use, cutting the magnetic lines of the earth, and it would, the earth would lose its charge, the water levels would drop. It was just generally detrimental to the plants, and Victor felt this was a serious problem that had to be looked into, and in his researches he discovered that copper, when used on farming implements, greatly increased the fertility of the soil and allowed it to remain rich and moist and supportive of life. This patent for Victor's copper plow was granted in 1950. Many of these golden plows, as they became known, were manufactured, but pressure from the fertilizer industry halted their production. He also worked on this model for a spiral plow, which would move the earth in a centripetal motion, copying the work of a mole as it burrows underground. This type of implement opened up a whole new field of biological machinery for agriculture. But despite his wonderful discoveries and with increasing bitterness, Victor realized that all of his attempts to alert the establishment to the breakdown of the ecological order were falling on deaf ears. He had fought all his life for the water, the forests, and the earth itself, but had in return been attacked, persecuted, and impoverished. His health was also failing. It was then that two Americans appeared and offered unlimited funds if he would travel to America and impart his knowledge for the good of humanity. Or so they said. 
Victor and his son were flown to Texas and taken to the solitude of the desert, far from his beloved forests and streams. There was no communication with the outside world. The post was censored. The funds never materialized, and Project Implosion, as it was called, became a nightmare experience. Finally, after being tricked into signing everything over to these men, Victor was permitted to return to Austria. Five days after he returned home, he died in despair, saying, They took everything from me. Everything. I don't even own myself. But his message of survival is more urgent than ever before. The only way left is a return to nature. Elements die, as men die, on account of the corruption in them. As water at its death, as it were, consumes and devours its own fruit, so does the earth its own fruits. Whatever is born from it returns to it again, is swallowed up and lost, just as the time past is swallowed up by yesterday's days and nights, the light or darkness of which we shall never see again. It is no weightier today than yesterday, not even by a single grain, and will, after a thousand years, be of the same weight still. As it gives forth, so in the same degree it consumes. The death of the water, however, is in its own proper element, and that great terminus and center of water, the sea, wherein the rivers and whatever else flows into it die and are consumed as wood in the fire. Rivers, indeed, are not the element of water, but the fruit of that element, which is the sea. From this they derive their origin, and in this they receive both their life and their death. 